Well. Today, we're talking about being a living sacrifice for God. And we're specifically looking at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, in which Paul says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let us pray. Lord, we are just so thankful for your, for your word today. Your word is intended to change us. Your word is intended to to transform us. We pray for that power to be released today among your walls. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do those look like happy people to you? <clears throat> this, is, this is a picture I took in Taiwan inside a temple. And this is after the people have worshipped. You see joy? Offering themselves as a living sacrifice. They look like they've been slain at the altar, haven't they? And, you know, that was one of the things that we just thought was so interesting is the people went in the temple distraught and they came out of the temple distraught. They were just usually a little wider in the wallet at the end. And this cuts out some of it, but... You can see to the left of that basket there, bundled pieces of paper. That's what they call ghost money. Okay? I call it spending good money after bad. Because you have to buy this special money and then burn it because that's the only thing your ancestors can use in their afterlife. They can't use regular money. They can only use, you've got to buy this money. And you offer this money. And then it burns up and somehow it just reappears. So they could buy things in the afterlife. Isn't that amazing? There's so much superstition into some of these beliefs. It's incredible. They put out, you know, we talked about, oh, in the Old Testament, putting out offerings. But they, every month, they'll put out a table in front of their house and put food like this out on the table. Put incense, usually burn incense in there or whatever. There's one day for your residence and there's one day for your business. And then oftentimes you see these burn barrels out in front, usually right next to the cars, and they're burning money, okay, for their ancestors. So it's a whole combination of beliefs, because burning money for your ancestors, that's called ancestral worship. Then there's Buddhism, then there's Confucianism, then there's Taoism, and there's just everything combined. And they may call themselves Buddhists, but it's just a combination of beliefs. And the problem is they want to add Jesus to their aisle shelf. And there's been missionaries in these countries before, like Taiwan, that have allowed them to do that. You know our God's a jealous God. He wants, he wants to be the only one to be worshipped. But they're used to praying, okay, I pray, go to this temple, pray to this God for my son's education. I go to this temple and pray for my operation or pray for healing. I go to this temple. So there's a God specifically for each, each thing in your life that you're to pray to. And each time you go in there, lightens your wall a little bit too. Because you've got to pay for this. You've got to pay for prayers. You've got to pay for prayers. And for worship and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, they, I, I just love their faces because it's like, you go in distraught, you come out distraught. We talked to, uh, I have a lot of stories, but I'll just share one more. We talked to this one gentleman that came out of Temple one time. And he had a business. It had something to do with golfing or making golf balls or something. And he felt like he was told, well, they have things that you throw for yes or no answers and, you know, different things. And he, and he kept getting that he was supposed to do this business. And so he did it. And the business was failing. 
So he went back to the temple, and the temple said, keep on doing it. So he, he continued doing it, even though it's, it's failing, because that's what he felt like his God was telling him. So what is a sacrifice? Well, if you look in a dictionary, I mean, a sacrifice is basically bringing or slain animals, food. Uh, back in the Old Testament, sometimes it was live human, like babies, that were killed and so forth and worshipped to gods. But it's usually something you bring to sacrifice for a deity, for some type of God. Okay? And for what purpose? Why? I mean, we look in the Old Testament, we see our God that we were to bring slain animals as sin offerings or other offerings to the Lord as well, right? But for what purpose? Or today, are we still to sacrifice anything to God? Well, if we look at Romans 11, 36, it says, For, from him, and through him, and for him, are all things. To him, what? The glory. That's what it's all about. Amen. That's what our lives are all about. That's what being a living sacrifice is all about, is for the glory of God. That's why we're here. That's why we exist. That's why he created us. It's all for his glory. Not our glory. His glory. So to be a living sacrifice calls on us to offer ourselves to be used by God. Offer ourselves to be used by God as a gift unto Him. Stay alive. Don't slain yourself to be offered to God. Okay? But as a living sacrifice. Now see how Jesus has changed this. You know, he comes in and he just turns everything upside down. Everything that was right now is wrong. Everything was wrong. You know, it's like he just flips things over. So we are to offer ourselves as living sacrifice, not slain animals anymore, and holy and pleasing to God. So that means what? That means we need to live lives holy, set apart unto him, God. Not holy unto our culture, holy unto worldly ways, but holy unto God, set apart unto Him, pleasing to Him. Paul says in here, he starts off, he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. This word urge is kind of interesting because it basically means, in Greek, to call alongside to help. For God to come alongside us, to help us, as a comforter, giving us the Holy Spirit to live inside of us, right? Exhorting, encouraging, counseling us. So we've got this Holy Spirit now with us. They can lead us, they can guide us, they counsel us. King David said in Psalm 51, 17, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. A broken and contrite. What's that, that word, contrite? Lowly in spirit. A sorrowful heart. A crushed heart. A remorseful heart. That's what God wants. That's part of being a living sacrifice. To have that heart that is broken for Him, for God. A heart that wants to follow God. And her Hebrews chapter 13 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise goes on to describe the fruit of our lips and openly profess his name. Do not forget also to do share with others or with such sacrifices God is pleased. What's this remind you of? Anything about love God first and then love your neighbor? Profess his name? 
Make Him first. Love Him first. But don't forget about others. You're also to love one another as well. This is what God sees as pleasing sacrifices. A life that lives for Him and a life that serves others. Live for Him and serve others. By serving others, you are serving God. Profess His name. Serve, do good. Share with others. That is what pleases God. Oh, then we got the world. We got the world, right? So, John says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If you love the world, love of the Father is not in you. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. We were talking this morning at Bible study about death and the mute. And Jesus heals death and mute. And Ernie just shared a, a great example about that's why he felt that scripture was speaking to him. Before he had Jesus, he felt he was death and mute. That's the way he felt. I'm sure others have felt the same way before Jesus. Jesus opens our eyes. He unlocks our ears. But he also frees our mouth to profess his name. Why is it so important that we profess his name? What did Jesus say at the end of Matthew? Go and make disciples. That was not a suggestion. That was a commandment. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? Go make disciples, profess the name of Jesus. Because God doesn't want anyone not know him. God does not want anyone to go to hell. And so we're all commissioned as priests. We're all commissioned as evangelists. We're all commissioned as, as disciples to go out and make more disciples. To share who he is. To profess his name among a fallen world. You think materialism can be an obstacle? Yeah. <laughs> Remember the whole thing about I read love of money. Okay. Yeah. Love of possessions, right? Power. <laughs> Power. You know, if you've got all the money in the world, what do you do? You run for president, right? But anyway. <laughs> but but there's there's an appeal, you know, you may have a power too. Unfortunately, sometimes people apply for positions. Because not so much that they want to serve is they want the position for power, mm. for control, independence. What's our whole culture about? You know, if it pleases me, it doesn't matter about anybody else. It's just about me. Yeah. And how often do we get caught into we want to we want to make our own decisions without consulting God? We don't need God. This is a simple, straightforward decision. I made that mistake. I made that mistake when we moved back from Taiwan. And it was a terrible and it was a costly mistake. We assume that we should be shipping, we'll ship some of our household goods back. But by the time that we got them, it cost us five times what they were worth. And we didn't know it was going to be that expensive. Costs just kept adding up, you know, custom fees, uh, shipping. Oh, we, you know, movers come, oh, you got more weight than we brewed, so it's going to be this much more. You know, it just kept going up and up and up. I know, but it seemed like at the time, it's a common sense decision. I know if I would have consulted God, he said, don't do it. Don't do it. Just like when we, um, before we went to the mission field, you know, we were in Tucson, Arizona, and we had owned our house for about 12 years. The market had been soft for the first 10 years, and the final two years was when the market boom took place. And my wife was saying, we should sell the house before we go to Taiwan. I said, no, well, I have a plan B. What if the mission field doesn't work out? I want a house I can move back into. We'll rent it. She goes, I don't know. She says, I think we're supposed to sell it. I said, okay, let's pray about it. So we prayed about it. God said to sell it. I said, okay, we'll sell it. We listed in the market. Again, this is the height of the market. In July, we listed in the market. Uh, open house on Friday. Monday, we had three offers for the asking price or above. We picked which offer we wanted. Sold it, was closed in two weeks. 
September the market went down. That's how close it was. Mm -hmm. That house now still is not worth what they paid for it. And uh, although the market's gone up, it's getting close, but this was, what, nine years ago? So, I can't remember exactly when it was a year ago. That's when the market went down. Yeah. Idolatry. Materialism can also become idolatry, right? Now, who, what man in this house would not want to drive this car, okay? <laughs> what you know, what woman, okay? <laughs> Right. One of my, I guess maybe it's on my bucket list is just to get out on a NASCAR. I'd just love to get on a NASCAR track and drive a NASCAR high performance car once around the track. This thing would be fun. Um, but does this mean God doesn't want us to have cars? No. Of course not. Of course not. He knows our needs. But do we need a fancy luxury mobile or do we need a Toyota? You know, no offense, Daryl. But, oh, I'll hurt you. <laughs> but, um, but the other thing is, I've seen, because I was in sales, I've seen, you know, and you have quotas to meet, and so you get, supposedly the motivation is money. That's how they try to motivate you, okay? If you do this and this, you know, you want a trip to Hawaii, whatever, this. And I'd see people post a car above their desk. Mercedes Benz or something, something that they really want. And that's their motivation to sell. Now, not only is that materialistic, you know what else that becomes? It becomes an idol. Mm -hmm. Because everything you're focused on is to buy that car. And so God says, anything that you make more important than me is an idol. It could be your spouse, it could be your child, it could be your dog, it could be a car, it could be anything. But anything that you make more important than God becomes an idol in your life. So those are things we have to be careful of. Do not conform. Do not, what is our culture all about conforming, right? Okay. Um, we have to understand that there's God's law and there's man's law, okay? And just because something may be legal in our culture doesn't mean it's something that God wants us to partake in, okay? Um, you know, things like, does God say you cannot drink alcohol? I don't think he says that. I mean, they drink wine and so forth. He does warn against getting drunk, though, doesn't he? Okay. Excessive use. And I think a lot of things we we can apply that is excessiveness. Well, it becomes excessive. Well, if you become an alcoholic, the drink becomes more important than anything else. It becomes an idol. You're a drug addict, the drug may become more important. If you're a gambler, the gambling addiction may become more important than God. And those are the things that God warns us about. Even though it may be legal in our culture, it doesn't necessarily mean it's pleasing to God. form outward expression. And that's, you know, we look at the Bible of the Pharisees, and that's what they were all about, was the outward expression. Inward, their hearts were hard, but outwardly, they looked very religious, right? Um, outward expression of our culture, okay? This world, you know, accepting the beliefs and the values of this world, which may be contrary to God's values. And so we have to be careful. Just because it's of this world doesn't necessarily right. Okay. Just because it's okay in our culture doesn't necessarily mean it's right. We have to compare it to the Word of God to see what the Word of God says. We may be called names as a result. That's part of being set apart. Transform. Literally means and when. They use this word here in Romans, literally means metamorphosis. Mm. What's the other word? Metamorphosis. Just rolls off the tongue. Which we think about with the butterfly, right? What's metamorphosis? It totally changes shape or form mm. from a caterpillar to a butterfly. That's metamorphosis. When you totally change form, right? Outwardly, express 
the change that has gone inwardly in your heart. Again, in this morning's Bible study, we were talking about heart, you know, and about, about words that come out of our mouth. And sometimes we think, where did that come from? Because we may have not consciously thought of it, because it's coming out of emotions, coming out of feelings, it's coming out of things in our heart. We may have anger in there, we may have hatred, we may have bitterness, we may have unforgiveness. And that's maybe where those words are coming from. That's why we've got to allow God to change our heart. We can act outwardly a certain way, and God sees right through that. But if you allow him to capture your heart, allow him to change you, allow him to transform you from the inside out, the outwardly is just the outward expression of what already has been changed inwardly. One of the ways is by renewing our mind. And the Holy Spirit does that. The Holy Spirit can change our Ways of doing that, and studying the Word of God, time in relationship with God through prayer, through time of worship, through honoring Him, through living a life that pleases and honors God, that brings glory to Him. But we have to allow the Holy Spirit, we can't force this change necessarily in and on, unto ourselves without allowing the Holy Spirit to do it. The, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to change us. God's all about free will. God's all about free will. And the scripture this morning, you either choose God or you don't. There is no middle road. He gives us free will. If we, if we choose not to choose, then we chose not to choose. We chose against God. So you either choose God or you're against God. This walking the fence, this marginal stuff, it's not in Scripture. That's it's not what it's about. Those who have died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? We've been baptized into Christ, into His death. What's that a picture of? Baptism, right? Baptized into the watery grave and rise up again. Buried through Him, baptism, death, order, that we may be raised. Why does God want us to be raised out of this watery grave? To live a new life. A new life. To die to sin. To be changed. To be baptized. Buried with Him. A new life. That's what God wants for us. And you know, we talk about sacrifice, a living sacrifice. It's really not a sacrifice in the fact that we're giving up the bad stuff for the good stuff. Amen. Now, if you call that a sacrifice, I don't know. Yeah. You know, but the people that say, well, I don't want to be a Christian because i got to change my lifestyle. I said, you're believing a lie. That's right. <laughs> because if you're happy in that lifestyle, tell me you're happy in that lifestyle. And many cannot. God wants so much more for more than we can possibly imagine. He wants to bless us, allow us to accept His love, to be loved by Him. He wants us to live a new life. A life of what? Abundance. Joy, abundance, blessing. Yeah, that's what He wants for us. Sure He does. We have to live also a life of what? Repentance. What? As well, we have to we have to we have to clean our, we have to clean that crap out. You know? there's no if we don't clean it out, there's no room for God. Say it. So it's not hmm, God's here to serve me. I want this. I want this. I want this. No, we're here to serve God. And if we're here to serve God, then we've got to clean this crap out, those wounds, those hurts, the unforgiveness, the bitterness. Hatred, the anger, all that crap that's in there, all that darkness, and get it out and expose the light so the Holy Spirit can take up residence inside of us and live. Thank you, Lord. 
commitment. And that's why it takes commitment from you. It's, it's a two-way thing. It's not just, God, do this for me. It's like, we have an obligation to. Obligation to spend time in His Word. His Word is transforming. His Word is transforming. Prayer and worship. And this is a part that's often left out. It's important to be in relationship with other believers. Yes. We need to support one another because out there, it's brutal. Yes. We are attacked every day by others. And so that's why we need the encouragement of one another. So that's why it's important we come together. God always does, it's designed for us to come together, to worship together, to support one another. Yeah. You know, people will say, well, I cri I'm Christian. And you may say, well, what church do you go to? And you say, well, I don't go to church. And I don't see it necessarily a requirement in the Bible to go to church. But God says you are to worship with others. You are to encourage one another. And my question for somebody like that is, what's your accountability? And then if you start getting back, well, how much time are you spending in God's Word? How much time are you spending in prayer? Are you meeting at all with other people that are also believers? Because we need one another. God did not design us to live in isolation. God designed us as social creatures to interact with one another. And part of Christians interacting with one another is supporting one another. It's one of the reasons I, I, I really like the motorcycle chapter, because these are mature, strong Christians that we can share our lives together. And, and it's just so great to be around them. They're supportive. Mm -hmm. God first. He's number one. <laughs> Listen, one of our missionary friends, he was a, oh, gosh, what a great worship leader he was in Taiwan. But anyway, he, he was talking about when they, I don't know, it was in high school, whatever, they choose up teams and this team beat the other team, they always go around, we're number one, we're number one. We're not. That's God. <laughs> He's number one. He's number one. Hopefully nobody here doubts that they're saved. If not, please, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. We should all rest assured that we've been saved. But you know what? There's more than that. There's more than just being saved. God saved us so that, so that we could be changed. You know, he says that we are to become more like Christ. That's part of that transformation. That's part of that metamorphosis that's to take place inside of us. That we are continually growing to be more like Christ. That he didn't design us to be stale. He designed us to grow in him. It used to be if you stay where you're at, you're going backwards. It used to be the same. So you're either moving forwards or you're going backwards. So what God wants us to do is to continue to move forwards to him. To continue to become more like Christ. And it is a lifelong process. It's not something that happens. You may be saved overnight. You may be delivered from an addiction. You may be whatever it is. But... To walk in the way of Christ is a lifelong journey, right? And we are called to follow Jesus. Because by following him, his leading will transform us, will change us. Right? Amen. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. Transform into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from doesn't come to us. It comes to the Lord. This is God no longer wants slain animals at the altar. He wants you to be a living sacrifice unto Him, representing Him, representing His glory, witnessing and professing His name and who He is. He wants your life to be dedicated unto Him. What do I owe him? Well, you owe him your life. He gave it to you. Amen. Amen. Holy living pleases God. Sold out unto you. 
scripture I don't think anybody knows like in Revelation 3.16 where God says if you're lukewarm I spit you out. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. There's too many lukewarm Christians. Mm -hmm. There's not enough Christians on fire for the Lord. We need to be, be praying for more Christians to be on fire for the Lord. You realize if the church, and I'm talking church universal, if the church in America would unite and set aside some of the petty differences in theology, how powerful a force in change could be for this country. But Satan is so good at keeping churches not only separated from one another, divided in their own churches. Satan is a god of division. Not a god, but Satan is a person of division. God is a god of multiplication. God wants to multiply, Satan wants to divide and separate. I'm already saved. Why change? Why change? Why not? Why not? God is something better. Amen. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here today, but. We all know somebody that needs the Lord, that we need to be praying for, we need to be witnessing to. In our own life, you know, who do we give our homage to? Who, do, who have we placed on the throne? Is it God? Or is it something else? When we say, Jesus, your Lord and Savior, we always, we like to, and I talked about this before, we like to cling to the part of the Savior. Yes, he saves me. But don't forget the part about Lord, meaning he is a ruler in your life. He's the one that rules, not you, not someone else. We say, make him Lord, he is your master. The master of your household. Worship is by the way we live. It's not just coming here Sunday and singing. Our very lives are worship, how we lead them. Often our body, even foods we eat, whether we're good stewards, and that can be financial or just good stewards over our body. Service, are you helping others? Are you serving others? What are you doing to help them as well? But it also does mean meeting together in worship, because that is something God intended for us to do, is to come and fellowship with one another as well. But when we worship, it also not only should be engaged in our heart, it should be engaged in our mind as well. And so I say, you know, don't just sing the words, but you need to believe the words when you sing. Or when we read scripture, let that scripture change you. Let that scripture transform you. The words are important that we are singing back or speaking back to God. How we sing is not so important as what we sing. It's a process. Renewing our minds is a continuing process, a lifelong journey. But here's the question, what are you feeding your mind? Garbage in, garbage out. If you love garbage in, that's what's going to come out. And that's what's going to be in your heart. If you have a heart of lust, maybe it's because of what you look at, maybe um, whether it's on the internet or in magazines or other things or what you watch. Or are you listening to music? I, I personally, I, I don't listen to hardly anything other than worship music anymore. I just Christian music because it's encouraging, it's supportive, and it helps me in my worship and time with and if you don't listen to worship music or Christian music, I just ask you to take some time out of your day and try listening to some. I'm not saying turn it all to Christian or worship music, but listen to some. Listen to some. Internal transformation. When we have an internal transformation in our heart and mind, it reflects God's will. That's how we serve the will of God. Is because of desire, because of want, not because of, of 
obligation. Not because we feel like we have to. That's what went on with the Pharisees. They told the people what they had to do, and they had to do it reluctantly. They did it reluctantly. It was not out of a heart of love or service. It was a heart out of necessity. God wants our minds to reflect his will. He wants our hearts to want to serve and follow him. To be a like mind. I said before, you know, you have two choices. You either serve God or you serve Satan. You know, and so you have to make that decision for yourself. Who do you want? Who are you living for? Who do you have your trust in? Who is it that you want to serve? Now, you can be saved and still serve and Satan. There's many Christians that are serving Satan. And and most of the time, they don't even know. That's part of Satan's deceit. We want to be Christians that are sold out to God. We want to be Christians that are not only saved, but they're serving God. Yes. Through acts of worship, by the way they live, by the way they act, and by the way they treat one another, that you will know them as Christians. This is a time invitation. If anybody needs prayer, you're welcome to come forward. I'd be happy to pray with you. Or if you need prayer after the church, um, please let us know. Um, we want to be known as a church that prays. And a church that honors God through worship and praise as well as prayer. And so, um, this is a time we're just going to reflect. I'm going to show a video, like I usually do. And it's just time of reflection. If you want prayer, come forward. If not, please stay seated. And, Use this time to, to meditate, Jesus. God doesn't always do what we want him to do. But then he's not our servant either. But you have to believe that he knows what's best for you in every situation. Maybe not be the answer you want, but he knows what's best for us. And so therefore, we have to trust in him. We have to put our lives in his hands in order for his power to be released in our lives. Let me say that again. We have to totally trust in him in order for his power to be released. And so if you're praying and crying out to God and say, God, you're not answering. God, you're not doing this. God, you're not doing that. We have to... We have to internally look and see if there's something that's preventing him from working in our own lives. Have we totally given up to him? What's it mean, totally given it up to him? It means that we will be content with whatever happens in the situation. That no longer do we worry about, no longer are we going to control it. It's not like, okay, God, I want you to work in this situation. However, this is the result of what I want to happen or what to take place. Uh -oh. If you want God's power to release the situation, you have to totally give it to him and say, God, I'm giving it to you. If I have to go to jail as a result, that's okay. If I have to be kicked out of the country, and I'm talking about my own personal circumstances, <laughs> when we were in Taiwan, it's okay. If we have to pay a big fine, it's okay. Whatever, it's okay because I am content in you. I know you know what's best. And I'm not going to worry about it anymore. It's in your hands. Whatever happens, happens. And that's a hard place to get to. But unless you get to that place, God's power, you're limiting what he can do. You have to totally surrender it for him to work in the situation. I came up with a new prayer slide, and it's just something I felt I needed to do. That I wanted a cross there, and I purposely put the word prayer towards the bottom of the cross. Because that's exactly when we pray to God, we need to submit our prayers to the foot of the cross. So I thought maybe this gives better imagery as we pray to God. It's the cross. And his blood at the cross that gives us forgiveness. And so when we think and we're asking him and we're seeking him through prayer, 
I think sometimes we need to be reminded of the cross. And when we, when, and just what I was saying, when we submit those prayers to him, we're putting under the foot of the cross and we're giving up any control over that situation. And allow God to work. Let us pray. Lord, we are just so thankful that you do answer prayers. Lord, that you are a God of mercy, a God of grace, a God of love, infinite love. Lord, we pray right now that you just fill this body with your love and your compassion. Let us know how much you love us. Let us know how much you care for us. Let us be willing to give our lives over to you, to be a willing sacrifice unto you, that by everything we do, it glorifies you. Not ourselves, but you and you alone. May our very lives be a witness to who you are. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.